Hi, uh, and welcome to a new episode of Bergeron Briefs. My name is Art Bergeron. Uh, I'm an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, I do these shows here um, and in several other communities to allow you to understand the players and to meet the players who are involved with elder issues day to day. I really try to do these to supplement a lot of the work that I do in seminars um, here in your community and in several others. Uh, so I'm fortunate today that my guest actually works right here uh, in Westboro, and that's Gary Davis, uh, who works at the with, with the salmon companies in at the Willows and Beaumont. And so, Gary, tell us what you do. What do you do, and kind of how did you come to be doing it? I know you told me that you've been there for a number of years, right? Oh, I've been with Salmon and Health and Retirement for over seven years. That's a um, while. It's probably my, I, honestly, I have to say it's my favorite job I've ever had. Um, and my job is to oversee the Alzheimer's services and specifically our tapestry programs. We and so have. talk about how tapestry plays out in relation to the various kinds of services that you have. Okay, uh, tapestry is the name we have for our um, specialized services for people with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. Mm -hmm. And so we have tapestry programs in a different couple models according to our continuum. So yep. we'll have a Whitney Place tapestry program, which is our assisted living model. Yeah. For those that require more medical attention, we have our Beaumont Skilled Nursing tapestry program. And we also have two adult day health centers where we follow the tapestry philosophy and really specialize in providing really good quality Alzheimer's and dementia care. Now, I know a lot of people have heard of, most people know about assisted livings. You have a sense of what that is mm -hmm. and nursing homes and of what that is. And I think we're going to get back to those. Can you just talk about the, the, the adult day programs, a lot of people kind of aren't aware of those or may not be aware of those, and I just want to understand what those are in general and then how they would apply specifically to folks to dealing with the, with the Alzheimer's issue. Okay, certainly. Um, really, we've, we've pretty much determined that the best treatment for Alzheimer's disease and people with Alzheimer's is socialization and being around people mm -hmm. and being in a supportive social environment. Adult day health programs offer a great opportunity for that because people can come in the morning, mm -hmm. get a full day of programming and monitoring and socialization and fun, and then go home in the evening. Um, and our adult day health programs are also a full-scale medical model. So we have um, licensed nurses on, on board. Yeah. Um, we accept Mass Health. Yeah. And we have contracts with um, the, all the home care agencies to yeah. help, pro help provide for us. So it really, um, it's a great option for families, you know, taking care of someone at home. Right, it, it, because so many of my clients, I know that kind of the mantra that I always use is that, is that the, the clients that I have, they want to stay in their house until they die and be buried mm -hmm. in the backyard. Everybody's kind of goal is that, right? But w with that in mind, we were just talking about that a little bit too, because one of the things that I talk to my clients about is, it's great to be staying at home for as long as you can, as long as you're safe, as long as you're safe. Mm -hmm. But there's a point at which, you know, that, that may not be the case. So, and we were just, we were talking earlier about kind of, you, 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 kind of the, the, the approach to Alzheimer's, which you've seen over kind of a number of years, and to folks who are, who are living with Alzheimer's right now, and to the folks who are their partners who are trying to help them out, kind of go, going through a lot of that stuff. Can you just t talk about how that approach has evolved or the thinking of folks who have Alzheimer's has evolved and, and therefore how the programs at, the, ta at the, the tapestry program may have changed in order to deal with that? And, and I guess I'd like, you to, I'd like you to start off, if you could, if, I'd like to talk about, how, about that in the context of an assisted living residence, right? Because there, people are there all the time, so I would assume that, that, that there, to the extent that you're trying to learn about Alzheimer's, you're seeing it, and your staff are seeing it kind of all through the day. Maybe we can mm -hmm. kind of talk about that, and then maybe talk about how that affects the way you deal with folks who, who also need more skilled care, like the nursing home folks, mm -hmm. and then for the folks that are at home. So okay. How, how's that? That's all right. That's, that's a, a long-winded. Uh, all right. A long I think one of the things that's evol definitely evolved over the years yeah. in Alzheimer's care is options, mm -hmm. and there's a tremendous number of different options and different programs to fit different people's needs that they weren't available, say, 20 years ago. I, my, I, I started doing this work because my mother died in a nursing home, and I remember at that time, 1991, 
I don't remember any of this stuff being mm -hmm. on. Right? It was just, oh, they were getting old and they were forgetful and you know, hardening of the arteries, that's all you heard about, right? Yep. And, and, you went, and you were at home and then you went to a nursing home and that was that, mm -hmm. you know. In, in 1991, it, you know, dementia programs were in their infancy. One of the things we have learned is that a l people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease really benefit from being around other people with the disease. You know, and I think an early oh. belief. So it's not just socialization with folks who aren't don't have the disease, but it's actually folks who may be experiencing some similar things. Mm -hmm. And one of the strengths of our tapestry program that we focus on is understanding people's current abilities as well as their past. You know, the foundation of good dementia care is based in knowing the person's life story, but mm -hmm. you also need to know their current abilities. And if we can cohort people of similar abilities or what I call similar stages together, mm -hmm. they can be very supportive of each other. And I think that for Alzheimer's care, that's your best case scenario. That's the, the, the holy grail, if you want to say, of, of dementia yeah. care is when you can create a, a, a sense of community yeah. when two or three or four people with Alzheimer's can really bond and create friendships and support people through their illness. I see. That's I see. that's the be I think that's, that's the really best the case idea. scenario. Now go back to something that you said. You said there were two things that you really you that are the kind of the foundations for working with folks who have got Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. and, and one of them you said was their life story, mm -hmm. and the other was kind of their kind of present status, their Correct. current cognitive abilities, right? Their present, yeah, their current the, the the where they are in terms of the disease process. Right? Correct. And I know one of the things we were, we were talking about before we started was this whole notion, as I had mentioned to you so often, as I tell clients, the hard thing about Alzheimer's is that, is that, that people don't think of it as a disease, they think of it as an embarrassment. And so much of this is getting used to people thinking the, it, the people are just sick, they get, they're sick, you know, and people are sick with different things, you know. But talk about the, the importance of that, the, the background, the background of the person in terms of dealing with, with the person with Alzheimer's. But one of the things that we really encourage family members to think about yeah. is to focus on what's still there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those clues for what's still there is grounded in their background and their social history. We know, for example, we know that long-term memories are preserved. So if we can get people to focus on those long-term memories rather than helping them to retain their ability to remember what day it is, it's going to be much more help. It's going to be much healthier for the person with the dementia. So I think looking, focus, and we call it focusing on strengths, focusing on remaining abilities. Yeah. I'll tell you, that's a heck of a lot easier for people like me and the staff I work with who don't have the history than it is for families. Families are often focused on the losses and what's not there anymore. And, um, right. You know, I had some, can I give you an example yeah. of that? Yeah. I, I was yeah. in our, I run several support groups. We have yeah. our, and I was in our Westboro support group and I was encouraging folks to focus on remaining abilities and what the strengths are. And one of the gentlemen in the group said, well, Gary, can you give me an example? Because he was having a hard time getting his, his um, mind around it all. And I said, well, he was just complaining how, not complaining, but he was mentioning how sad it was that he sat down with his wife, who has Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. to fill out greeting cards, holiday cards. Mm -hmm. And the first thing she said was, well, we have to make sure we send a card to Uncle Jim and Aunt Sophie. And he was devastated because Uncle Jim and Aunt Sophie had passed away 10, 20 years ago. And yeah. so he just saw the sadness of that loss. And I said, instead of that, instead of thinking of the sadness, think about, okay, she's remembering this aunt and Uncle this, Jim and Aunt Sophie. Right, she's remembering them, so let's make a card and send them a note and talk about them and take advantage of that memory that's still there. So I think that's oh, one that's of the, terrific. that's something that we try to encourage folks to do. And in one sense, that's difficult for families to do. In another sense, it's easiest for them because they know that background. Right. You know, we have to spend a lot of time with families um, asking them question after question after question and so that we can get that information. They have it all there. So if so if someone becomes a resident of the tapestry program mm -hmm in the assisted living facility, that's kind of part of what you need, that you, you realize that you need to be doing, is really trying to understand the background of that person. Oh, absolutely, that's one of, during the whole, um, before people even move in, we have a survey that we have people complete that we educate our caregiving staff on so that we can provide that person-centered care. 
So it's so it's a matter of really understanding the totality of that background, and also in a kind of understanding where where the where the individual is. Right. So h how do you how do you find staff, and how do you train staff to have that kind of focus, and to be kind of l l looking for those those ways of dealing with the folks who are in that retirement, in that in that community. Um, it was, it was we we just had, we're blessed with. I, with some with some staff that we've hired that have been with us for years. Yes, I think that's one of the big advantages that I that I have, and that I don't have to keep retraining folks. Um, I just came from here. I'm in between classes right now. We're doing train. I just came from a staff uh, training when we were talking about um, just this just the just the same thing. And I was looking around the table, and I've been training some of those people for seven years. And I think oh, so I think that's something that's that's a huge advantage, and we that's a general trend we see in most dementia care programs. Yeah, yeah. is the staff retention seems to be a, a little bit, a little bit better there than maybe in your traditional assisted living or your traditional nursing home settings. But you need to find the right person, and it's not right for some. We have an extensive training program that we go through, and I say right off, you know, this isn't for everyone. Right. You know, you have to have patience. You got to get used to answering the same question over and over again. And if that's going to bother you, maybe this isn't the right place. Maybe this isn't yeah. the right job for you. Yeah, um, it, and we're fortunate. That we, our our company has so many different options that it doesn't necessarily mean the person has to go somewhere else. We might be able to find another environment where right. they're better suited for. Right. So you said that you were just doing training, and a number of those people were the same people that you've had for a long time. Yeah. So, yeah. so in other words, you, there's. Is, is there kind of an ongoing, like within the residence, is there an, like an ongoing, like once a day or once a week kind of a discussion of kind of how's everybody doing in the, how's everybody doing in the community? Oh, absolutely. We have um, ongoing trainings for our staff. We have ongoing yeah. meetings. And I think that's something I would encourage family members to look at is involving a healthcare professional in the situation. Um, I think a lot of times uh, when I'm doing my support group, yeah. I really focus on trying to get family members to think about this as a disease and an illness rather than embarrassment, like you mentioned. Yeah. Um, and bringing in a, a healthcare professional, be it using an assisted living, a nursing home, adult day health, home care, someone else who's familiar with the disease that can help you with decisions and help you evaluate things, I think is a tr um, eases, you know, takes a tremendous burden off the care. Takes a lot of pressure off. Yeah. So you're you're now talking about people who are living with the illness at home, mm -hmm. and their and their caregivers. Yep. So so when can, can you describe like a typical? You you talked about the fact that you folks you, you do support groups also. Yes. And as I mentioned to you, I've i I'd gone to one support group meeting a um, while ago. Was not impressed with yeah, as, the, as, the, as the kind of what. <laughs> <laughs> so can you just kind of talk about that because I think that's that is a such a big piece of being able to live with this at home for yourself and for the person that you maybe care with you for for your spouse or for your parent or whatever is is being able to talk about it and being able to get better at I think you described the term which you, you told me you know the woman who kind of invented the term learning to speak Alzheimer's mm -hmm. right learning to speak really in in the language that's going to make that the person who has Alzheimer's the most comfortable and feel the most kind of supported right mm -hmm. so can you just kind of talk about what what happens in the support groups that or in the ideal support group what is going on okay well we're fortunate we run I run several different here in Westboro we have mm -hmm. daytime groups and evening groups our daytime group is co-facilitated by Joanne Koenig Cost who wrote the best-selling caregiving book on learning to speak Alzheimer's. By, by the way, which I would highly recommend. Yeah, I read the book, and I think I've read a lot of books. One of the nature of my work, most of my clients, those are my clients, are people who are worried about Alzheimer's, or they have Alzheimer's, or their spouses, have, or their or their significant others have Alzheimer's. So yeah. I've read a lot of those books, yeah. and I think this is about the best one. Yeah, right. Learning to Speak Alzheimer's um, by Joanne Koenig Cost is the top-selling Alzheimer's caregiver book on Amazon.com. Oh, I didn't um, know that. And it's in a support group. It's not. That we at we we is, there's nothing it's not technically a therapy group mm -hmm. it becomes more of a brainstorming session. Mm -hmm. um, I've always maintained it takes a tremendous amount of creative energy to care for someone with Alzheimer's, and create creative energy 
is amplified by people and getting people involved. Um, so a lot of times a support group is about brainstorming situations, being able to talk with people who are in the same situation you are. In any group you're going to have people that have been dealing with this longer than you and dealing with this less than you. Right. Um, so you get a really nice um, look at and you're not getting you're, you're getting suggestions from people who've already faced the situation and been in it so it's right. not so much a therapy group we don't ask you about your relationship with your mother or anything <laughs> like anything like that um, it's more talking about how you're coping and what are some options um, for the person you're taking care of it's the it's they've studied it it's the best most effective way to reduce caregiver burden is becoming involved in a support group I suppose because you, you're not, among other things, because you're not thinking like you're having to face this alone, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, or that this is the, you're the only person that's ever had to face this tension, mm -hmm. that, you know, because sometimes there are always those tension moments, mm -hmm. right? And they're, they're easy to find. If you go to ALZ.org, mm -hmm. which is the Alzheimer's Association website, they have sponsor um, support groups throughout the country. So you can go to ALZ, www.alz.org and click on their support group yeah. and you can find one in um, different times, different locations. I yeah. do suggest that you sometimes shop around because not all groups are created equal. I was just going to say that. Right? Um, and and it's there's nothing group. wrong with dropping out of a support group. No, they're free. The same. I have a lot of people just come once or twice and that's it. Right. Um, we have some folks that are taking care of someone who's um, loved one is in a different state you know some folks they're in nursing homes some folks are still at home they're living alone uh, but their different groups have different um, tones to them right so if right. you've tried one you didn't like it look up another one and go so one of the things that we were kind of talking about once again before we started today was this this question of how care has changed how the the nature of care for folks who were um, who are living through the, the, the Alzheimer's disease may have evolved or not over the last number of years. Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of talk about that? Because obvi obviously, I think the folks who are in assisted living facilities would be the, the kind of in the most interesting place to learn that because you're dealing with a whole set of residents interacting every day and you're interacting with them and you're watching them interact. So you would mm -hmm. think there would be some evolution in terms of well, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. But give me, give me your sense of that. I think we really figured out how to take care of people with Alzheimer's about 25 years ago. Um, and it's really basic. It's about being person-centered, mm -hmm. knowing the person, and having the goals of making people feel safe. You know, safety, you know. Are they yep. physically safe, and do they feel safe emotionally? And that's kind of the right. intent. So they're not being... D d diminished, right, or, or or I don't want to say made fun of, but they're they're, they're not feeling like that their their disease mm -hmm. means that they're not kind of really a person that they're not really there. Yeah. Correct. Um, so I think one of the ways it's evolved over the years is obviously options. Yeah. Um, but also looking at the emotional needs. You know, we're looking at it past the past the physiological disease things. Um, in our tapestry philosophy, we talk about having a community where people are safe and mm. they feel safe, but they're also instilled with a sense of purpose. They, have a, they maintain their dignity and have a sense of respect. They're part of a community, so they have friendship and love. Yeah. And these are kind of our, what we call our five essentials that we, that we build our whole program around. So can you talk about those a little bit? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the one that kind of jumped out at me just now was that sense of purpose. Yes. This question of, so how do you do that? Yeah. Because I would think that's got to be the it hardest, especially if you were in a job, or even during, just during your life, but if you were in a job that had a big cognitive component to it or a memory, big memory component to it, you know, how do you, how do you maintain your sense of dignity and purpose if you can't remember? Right. Um, and I had a, I had a, a staff member say that was several years ago, yeah. um, had said, we were talking about giving us people a sense of purpose. And she says, you know what? That's our chance to fight back, to fight back against the Alzheimer's. Because the Alzheimer's is trying to take that sense of purpose away. People, right. are, even in the early stages, they're left with a sense of failure that they can't do things, and if you're thinking you're gonna fail, what are you gonna do? You're just gonna sit there and not do anything. Right, or you're gonna and, be really angry. Yep. 
right? Or you're going to be yeah, you're going to be really depressed, or you're going to yep. be really angry at yep. somebody, either yep. at yourself or at somebody else. Absolutely. Right. Or at absolutely. God, somebody. Yep. Absolutely. Right. So that if we can instill that sense of purpose in that person, and that's going to come different ways for different people, but it gets. Give me, give me, can you give me some example? Well, my sense of purpose would probably come from from meaningful work. Right. Right. Um, you know, in. I, I, we always joke about what would happen if I get Alzheimer's disease and I'm in a program. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be about yep. educating. I do a lot of training, educating people. That gives me my sense of purpose. Um, someone who never had a job was a homemaker. I, I shouldn't say that wasn't a job, but I was someone, just, someone who's a homemaker. Yeah. Um, I could gonna, almost feel people rolling their eyes when you said that. Right, right. I, absolutely. I got, I got cut wrong. But someone who's a homemaker is going to get maybe get their sense of purpose from being from our intergenerational programming. Mm -hmm. um, from being able to set the table and do a lot of those household tasks, um, that's going to give them their sense of purpose. Um, people in the earliest stages say that's one of the things they miss most, is that sense of purpose. You know, you get, you get this diagnosis and all of a sudden you're not working anymore. Right. You don't have your job. You're sitting around the house. You don't need someone supervising you, but that feeling of worthlessness just starts creeping in and really the effective memory care programs really focus on giving people that sense of purpose. So you said that's one of the five kind of core pieces of what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So there's per sense of purpose. What else? Um, there's safety, um, comfort, um, friendship, and respect. Respect and dignity. And really can you just things. talk about some of those? So you, uh, the comfort and the talk, talk about comfort and talk about dignity. Yeah, comfort we talk about is are they physically comfortable? You know, um, do, are they in pain? You know, are they able to get to the bathroom okay and things like that? Making oh, sure see. that they're 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 you know they're phys we're meeting those physical needs to yep. to get that comfort. Um, yeah, because you, because they might be forgetting mm -hmm. for folks who are in later stages, and that they might be forgetting to go to the bathroom, or they yep. might ju not realize that there's a temperature issue that they should be yep. bothered about. Um, when we talk about you asked about respect, respect. Yeah, you know, respect maintains dignity. We kind of pair those together: dignity and respect. Um, we, we make people feel respected a lot by how we address them. You know, are we talking down to them like they're babies? Or are we talking to them like they're, they're the adults they are? Right. You know, are we respecting them as people? Are we respecting their abilities? Um, are we also respecting their, their disabilities? You know, one of the things, one of the key things we do for respect, and we were talking about this just this morning, yeah. you know, we aren't going to quiz people about what day it is. Because if they're going to fail, they're going to lose their dignity. So we right. it gets back to the, knowing those current abilities. Do they know what the, you know what what can and can't they do? Right. And the things that they can't do anymore, you know what? We just don't ask them about you it. You just don't even ask them. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a key way that we, we preserve that that and, dignity. And I suppose going back to your the the support group stuff, ha having the having that knowledge has to really help you in terms of helping the folks that are around the table mm -hmm. going back home. To realize some of the the kind of cues that might they might be inadvertently giving, mm -hmm. of lack of respect yep. or of or of you know lack of dignity. Like yep. that, yeah, that's a really that's a really important piece. And that's hard for families because a lot of that lack of respect sometimes gets shown in your body language, in your facial expressions, and that's not something you're used to controlling. Right. But that's something that, that they're very much in tune to. So let me ask kind of one of those fundamental questions that I get asked or that I have to confront all the time. I tell people you should stay at home as long as it's safe, but at some point you may want to consider assisted living. Mm -hmm. Just talk for a few minutes about when that is. And I know one of the things we talked about was, of course, it varies a lot from situation mm -hmm. to situation. But can you give a couple of global or some examples or some reasons of when you may want to be thinking about that? Okay, right. absolutely. Right. I think one of the questions you need to answer, you need to find out is does the person need 24-hour care? If someone mm -hmm. needs 24-hour supervision to maintain their safety, that would be, that's very hard. That answers the question. That's that very hard to do at home. Right. You're going to either, you can't do that alone. You either got to bring in people to help you or look for a, 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 a facility, I think, is, the, mm -hmm. is one thing. Other families will come to us because they're looking for a better life for their loved one. They're saying, I see my, my wife just sitting there all day watching TV. She's totally safe, but she's just withdrawing into herself. Um, I was talking with a family just yesterday yep. who was saying, my mother has totally changed. 
And when I hear that, I'm like, uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> and she says, she's coming out of her shell. She was always sad and withdrawing and depressed, and now she's out. And oh, this she's, is a person who's, who's, who's now in a system. Yeah, they just moved into our program yeah. a couple weeks ago. Um, and she went from a withdrawn, depressed woman to someone who's very outgoing and smiling and laughing and, and more cheerful now. I see. So they're, sometimes they're looking for that. Again, that best treatment for Alzheimer's is socialization. Now, if he'd have, they'd have asked her mother, do you want to move into this memory care program over in Westboro, what do you think she would have said? Right. Forget it. Yeah, forget it. No way. I'm never leaving my house. Right. And that's a whole other issue that families struggle with. So, so for people who are trying to figure that out, is there, can you go temporarily? Can you go for a short period to oh, an assisted living and kind of like test it out? Yep, and absolutely. That, is that common among the among assisted livings in general that you can kind of, you can go for a while and just... Yep, yep. For some, that the length of stay is gonna vary from, from, from person to person. Yeah. I usually say give it, at least try to let it go for a week or two. Um, right, right. Just to see if, just to see, just yeah. to see if the dynamic works. Yeah. And I suppose, and one of the things I've mentioned to clients is that assisted living is like going to college, you know, too. If you, you, if, you, if you need to kind of shop around mm -hmm. and, and you may find the place that's just going to click, mm -hmm. you know, that you're going to feel like, because your kids knew that when they were yeah. going, right? You were traveling around the colleges and maybe it wasn't the one you thought, but right. suddenly you, you know, that's my dad, this is the place that I feel right. So that might, that might actually be the kind of the right place for them. Yep. Absolutely. Well, listen, Gary, thank you so much for stopping by oh, you're very and welcome. talking about this. I think these are really important issues I think pe to, to give people a sense of what their options are, of thinking about Alzheimer's as not being, a, not being a, an embarrassment, you know, but being a disease and facing it and kind of finding the place where you can feel safe but also feel that sense of purpose and sense of respect. That's a wonderful kind of mantra for the, the goal of all of this. So thank you very much for uh, being with us and watching today, and I look forward to seeing you on my next episode of Bergeron Briefs. Thanks very much, and thank you, Gary. You're welcome.